And um, I look, I, I'm, you know, I, I know most of you, but I don't know some of you. But as I look, I, um, I see faces of expression of, yes, I know how good God is. And I love to see that. So I'm very thankful for that. And I'm excited to be here this morning. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to put a disclaimer out. It's been uh, quite a while since I shared a sermon. So if I falter, uh, lift me up. Pray for me. Uh, it's been a while, and and uh, then it seems like the enemy kind of uh, decided to come. I don't know what it is. Is it just life? But um, we we put. I was telling uh, Matt that we put uh, chickens in our chicken barn back in December. But about January first, first of the year, we had a bad water problem, leak, and it was nasty and it was a problem, and uh, got it fixed, and we had no issues until guess when? About two hours ago. <laughs> yes. And it's a mess. We have something to look forward to after a while, Dad. <laughs> Anyhow, but uh, so I don't know. I don't know why. Sometimes I wonder why does that happen, and you know what? What's the deal? And so it was. It was a, a bit of a like God. You know what a distraction right now. But anyhow, God is still good, and uh, and I believe that He wants us to to go on faith even when things challenge our faith to keep walking, because that's what faith is. So we're going to do that this morning, and, and I appreciate you guys uh, praying for us that we can do that, and we'll pray together that we can do that. But let's pray this morning first as we before we start. Um, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for being a good Father to us. As we just sang together, your great goodness to us, Lord, is, is just amazing. And Lord, we... Um, we realize that, uh, and we, we talk about it, we see it around us, that we live in a, in a broken world. There's things that are around us that we face every day of brokenness, uh, messed up lives, Lord, messed up things, situations that we deal with. And Lord, we want to bring those to you. And uh, God, I, I don't know every situation here. I'm not here all the time. Um, and so I don't know the heart of every person sitting here in this room. And I don't know exactly what's going on. I don't know the pain. I don't understand uh, the situation that is uh, breaking somebody's heart right now or, or a health situation. But, Lord, I want to lift those up to you. God, you know them. I don't have to know them, but you do. So right now, every situation in this room, Father, we bring them to you. We bring it to the foot of the cross, Lord. We, you said to cast our burdens on you that you will carry them. So, Father, right now in faith, we just... We just bring you these needs, Lord, these hurts, these problems, these, these situations that maybe look like a mountain that is absolutely impassable. We cannot get through. Or maybe a river that needs to be crossed that's swollen and rough and there is no way, like, no way humanly possible. And yet we know that you're the one that said yourself when you walked on this earth that uh, what's impossible to man is not impossible to God. So, Father, we hang on to that in faith. And help us, Lord, in increase our faith, as the disciples said, uh, to, to not just hang on, but, Lord, to, to move forward, to, to walk in faith and, and in, into those situations, Father, as you lead us and as you guide us. And so I lift up our, our nation to you right now. I lift up, the, as Matt uh, spoke about school starting this, in, in this situation that we're in, in, in this life here, in this, in this world, in this, in, and right down to our community with lots of questions, with lots of situations, unanswered situations, things that people are trying to figure out and understand, Lord, I just ask that you would be with our leaders in this country and in our nation and in our city. Father, I pray that you would be with us as dads and as fathers, as priests and leaders of our homes, Father, and those who lead in the homes uh, in, in every situation here in this, in, this, um, in this church, Lord, in this group of believers, in this, in this community, in this town, Father, I pray that you would be lifted up and that we would look to you, that we would walk in faith in, through these situations, these unanswered questions and, uh, and things that we don't understand, Lord. And so we just ask for your presence. We ask for your will to be done in our lives. We ask for healing. We ask for humbleness on our part that we would reach out our hand to you as Peter did when he was sinking, when he was despaired or discouraged when he saw the storms, Father. I pray that we would do the same thing. We would look to you. When we lose sight, when we get a glimpse of what's going on, and, and that our eyes would immediately turn to yours, and our hand would outstretch to you, Father, because you're a good Father that reaches down and gets us. 
and, and saves us, Father. And I thank you for that from not only our sin, but from the situations that we deal with you. You said you will walk through them with us. Um, the storm may not always go away, Lord. We recognize that, but we, we know that your promise is that you will walk with us through it, Lord, and we thank you for that. And, Lord, I lift up uh, this sermon to you, this, these words that I have that's on my heart, Father. I pray that you will be done through the weakness that I feel in, just in my body and my soul and in, in my, that, that my heart would be strong in you and that you would just use this mouth, this vessel, this pot of clay, Lord, to just share an, an encouragement and a challenge to, to each one of us this morning. I thank you for doing that. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so uh, Matt had called me, and, and I had no idea where God was going to lead me with this, but I was in a different worship service last Sunday, and right during the middle of that worship service, I was hit with this word, and it was restoration. And I haven't been able to get away from it since. Um, the fact is, <laughs> I'm sorry, maybe this is bad, but afterwards, my bride asked me, what were you researching during, during church? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you, I am really bad at this. I'm really bad at writing down and putting down words that I feel like God sometimes gives me and lets me see and have. But for some reason, right then and there, during that short period of time, it feels a, a sense God's, it, it was just... It had, I had to make some notes. I had to because if I wouldn't have, I would have lost it. And so that's the way it was. And I'm not a writer. I can't stand. I, I'm not a writer. Ask my family that are all over the world. They don't get letters from me. I'm embarrassed about that. But And maybe by God's grace, I will start writing because I feel like it would be a good thing. So pray for a miracle that I'll start writing. But this week, for some or this past week, for some reason, it seemed like God would give me these little nuggets and and i i had to stop what i was doing right there and i don't write so i'm really bad at grammar I, i'm just exposing my kind of <laughs> ignorance in some things right but it's it's amazing because i think god can use that so i just give him the glory for it but i i take my phone and i hit that little button and i speak it and then i had to organize so i don't know if you guys somebody else here that has some of those challenges i'm sure there is i'm sure i'm not the only one that doesn't like to write or doesn't know how to put it that's kind of a helpful, neat tool, right? Anyhow, it was, so I had all this week, as I'd be working or I'd be driving or I'd be doing something, and something as, as with this, this message would seem to kind of just come to me, and I knew I had to write it down. So um, I hope it's not too scattered. But uh, is there anybody here that uh, loves restoring stuff? Oh, yeah, there's a few people. Like what, trucks, cars, furniture? old stuff that's seen its best days and it's rough and the paint is gone and it's rusty and parts of it is gone. And you figure out a way, I can tell people know what they're tracking. So I'm not, I haven't done that much. I would like to. My neighbor has, I was over there uh, doing a little work on my neighbor's property and he has a 50s model pickup. I don't even, I think it was a Dodge. I'm not a car person. <laughs> That's, that's my bride. She's the car person. But anyhow, um, whatever it is, my, my vision is just to maybe sometime ask him if it's something I could get and I could restore. It'll probably never happen, but it is a little bit of a dream of mine. So I like that kind of stuff, too. I enjoy it, and I appreciate it. And um, so um, just, just hang on to that thought for a little bit. We'll come back to it. So the garden. Um, how many of you like gardens? Quite a few people like gardens. I think it's in us. I think it's a part of the creation that God made us to enjoy gardens. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't enjoy, enjoy a garden like I do, uh, I'm not, you know, it, people are a little different and there's different things and that, that's fine. That's, that's totally fine. But, but track with me a little bit about the garden. Um, I want you to imagine with me about the Garden of Eden. Have you ever done that? Have you ever thought, boy, if I could have just been Adam? I wouldn't have screwed that garden up, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> but we think that, don't we? I mean, am, am I the only one that's thought that? I would have not screwed that up. I mean, we get proud sometimes. We get, we get to thinking that we would have done something a little different, and it would have been better today, right? Don't we think that? Yeah, we do. I mean, let's just all admit it. So... <laughs> I, I, you know, but, but think about how it was. Think about the beauty, 
the absolute beauty of the garden setting, the, the flowers, the streams, the, the lush grass, the, the gorgeous trees, um, oh, the, the amazing animals, all the different kinds of animals. Who likes animals? Um, oh, how about the tasty edibles? Who likes food around here? <laughs> the fruit, you name it. I mean, think of that. Think of what you like. And Aubrey helped me out with this the other day a little bit. When he likes to talk with people, he likes to use this idea, and I really liked it, so I'll probably use it some more. But if you think of something that you like, or you, you get that picture of how beautiful it was in the garden, but in our human minds, we'll never really be able to see it, but you have to think of the best scenario of a garden you've ever seen that's almost flawless, right? Still going to have some flaws. I guarantee you there'll be a thistle in there somewhere. But if... If you can think of that and then times it times 10 million, that's how good it was. Can we think around that? I, my mind can't really go there, right? But that's how beautiful and amazing and awesome the garden was. It was a beautiful setting, um, but it didn't last, it seemed like, very long. Um, I, have a, I have a peach tree. We bought a piece of land here some time ago, um, and uh, I had been using that piece of land for a while already. But then we ended up buying it, neighboring to us. And then um, we um, started kind of doing some things over there, slowly but surely. And in a fence row that was probably not really taken care of for a decade or two, maybe, um, I one day was kind of messing around there and looking, and I see a fruit tree. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's two fruit trees. I think, I don't know if I even found a second fruit tree the same time. It might have been later, like maybe quite a bit of later, but there was a, I'm like, there's an apple tree in here. What is, wow. But guess what was growing up and suppressing the apple tree? Missouri, cedar trees, of course. Okay. Um, but guess what the other tree was? It was a thorn tree. There was trees growing up in and around and between these two trees that were planted by somebody close together. And it was just doing havoc on these beautiful fruit trees. And I was like, I can't have that. I'm going to take care of this. So we went in there and we cut out trees and we cut out trees, pulled them out and, and got those trees cleaned up. And man, I want fruit. I love fruit trees. I, I you know, Missouri is kind of a bad place for fruit trees, in my opinion, because bugs like them too. But um, today we're watching. So in the garden, the trees, you know, and, 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 and the anticipation of seeing fruit grow. And it's just awesome. I love it. And so for the first time in I don't know how long, this peach tree, it sits on an angle. I should have had a picture of it. It sits on an angle about like that because it was so crowded out by a big old huge cedar tree that was growing right next to it, and it just pushed it over. So it's growing on a 45-degree angle, maybe even more shallow than that. And it's just growing there. It looks kind of sad. But it actually looks pretty beautiful right now. Um, hey, it has peaches on it that are huge. <laughs> and they are not many, uh, but, you know, a good handful or two of peaches that are growing on it that are getting huge. And they just keep getting bigger and bigger. I'm telling you, they're like the tennis ball size. And they're now starting to get, you guys getting excited for a peach? I don't know how many of you like peaches. <laughs> they're, they're getting that kind of orange look on the top of them. They're, they're not just green anymore. They're getting color to them. So I'm, I don't know, I'm kind of excited about it, right? You can tell. Anyhow, um, so I'm really excited about trying to trying that out. But in that garden, thorns and thistles were non-existent. They were not there. We can't imagine that. I don't believe the idea of decay, rust, or mold existed in that beautiful garden. It, it didn't exist. It was not there. But we know what happened. I believe all of us know. We know what happened. We know the story. We know of the story of Adam and Eve and, and how that they, there was one rule. There was one thing in the garden and that they violated that 
that and, and sin entered. So sin was the problem. Sin changed everything. After sin, there was thorns. After sin, there was thistles. After sin, and we can't, we're not going to go into a lot, but that is when decay, mold, and rust, and all that stuff started happening. That's when thistles started happening. That's when, um, that, that's when everything changed. Everything changed, and everything went, went down from there. And um, so, uh, Gary, do you have some pictures for me? So, okay, why did I choose that bus? I'm not sure. It's kind of precious to me because um, I don't know if you remember Jan or not, but uh, she's the only one in this room that could even remotely remember if she does. But she might have been too young, and it might have been before she was in the community where we live. But um, my dad, um, when I was about eight, uh, when I was about seven, he bought his first vehicle ever. My dad had never owned vehicles. And so he bought his first vehicle, then he bought his second vehicle, which was a Chevy 2 station wagon, like a 60-some model. And, uh, but the family was growing, and we were blowing out the sides, so he decided it's time to get a bigger rig. So he bought something like that right there. And uh, memories of traveling across the country in one of those was amazing. And uh, so, um, but hey, that's kind of sad looking, isn't it? Do you, can you imagine something, sir? What you could do with that right there? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I could. I could because oh. I like the message. Exactly. <laughs> see, that's right. You've got a vision. You can see what could be done with that. Gary, can we have the next one? Okay. Yeah, he, he got it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. So um, with, with a lot of time, right, patience, TLC, Look what, look what a crea creator can do. And uh, so, um, yeah. Okay, next one. So I thought maybe some of you like trucks instead of buses. <laughs> um, probably not the best one there, but I thought that was kind of cool. So there's a before and after. There, there's restoration right there. Uh, look at that. Look at It's straight. Look at how that bumper looks on the front. It's just bad on that white one, but then when the new one, look, look at how straight and it, it fits. It's nothing, no, nothing, it's perfect, right? I mean, I'm sure there's, but it, it's amazing what a creator can do with something that's messed up. So uh, what do we have next? Uh, does anybody recognize that place? Anybody at all recognize that place? I didn't know if you would or not. Somebody thinks they might recognize it. You guys might be the right ones to recognize that. Anyone want to guess where that's at? No? You don't have to. So let's, let's go to the next picture. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh good, good. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I, I, I got ahead of myself. I got ahead of myself. Uh, has anybody, no, just go ahead. We, we messed this up already, so let's just go ahead. Does anybody recognize that, please? I am about positive somebody should. Of course, there's not as many people here as there are sometimes, so maybe not. Nobody recognizes that, please. Did anybody go to school in Roscoe? No? Yes? We had one that went, anybody else? Mr. Swopes, do you know where that place is now? Is that, does, are you familiar with that picture or not? No? Not really? Okay. I was, I was thinking somebody might recognize that. Okay. So there was a building at the, at the Roscoe School that is called the Bus Barn. That's what that building is. Um, it's pretty old. But um, we're kind of proud of it. I'm, I'm just going to admit it. Um, we, we made it, well... I shouldn't take too much credit. I was kind of at the head of it, but I didn't have a lot of hands on it much. Um, so I got to be really careful because the crew that did it will probably say, don't take too much credit for that. We did the hard work. But uh, flip that back again. So that's how it looked when we walked in, and that's how it looked when we were done. Um, I mean, kind of impressive. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of cool, right? Uh, that's the kind of stuff I can do. Put me on that bus. Mm-mm. <laughs> I have no gifts and talents in that area, but that there I can do or we can do. And, and it's just, so 
That building was restored. That's how it looks today as of, I think, uh, was that in January 2017 when we did that? It was cold. It was nice to have an inside job that day. But anyhow, it was, uh, it was amazing. So it, it, it's totally amazing how different something can be, you know, something that's old and decrepit and how it can be changed, right? So that's amazing. So um, that's transformation. And God is a God of transformation. Uh, the awesome and amazing thing is that our Father, our God, our amazing, loving, kind, patient God was not willing to see us remain in that situation and immediately came up with a plan. In, Gen in Genesis 3.15, um, speaking to the serpent, and, and you can go back and read more to get the tech context of this if you want to, but I don't, I'm not going to share you know, all of what happened. A lot of you probably know. But Jesus, or God said, speaking to the serpent, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and, and between your offspring and her offspring, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Um, it is believed that in that verse, that uh, in this passage of Scripture, it points to the promise of Jesus' birth. His redemption and his victory over Satan. This remarkable verse is often been called the first gospel. And I believe that to be true. Um, and so... God had a plan, immediately set a plan in emotion, immediately. When we messed up, when we sinned, when sin messed up that relationship, you know, and, and one thing I want to just kind of touch on is, is what uh, we sometimes focus on the, on the thistles and the thorns. Man, I got to work by the sweat of your brow. Now you will take care of, you know, Wilbur and I and you men, Mike, we, we are responsible, and, and you ladies too. We, 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 it's not easy, is it? It's not easy. There's been, there's a change has come. But immediately, God put into motion a plan of restoration, a plan to restore back what was taken and what was destroyed and what was messed up, to restore it back to how he wanted it, to back to the plan that he had for you and I, back to the plan that he had, that he put in us, that thing that's still in us, that thing that is in you, brother, that you enjoy seeing something being fixed and restored back to, to make it to what it was originally, to, to bring that character back out to what, it, what was lost. And that's God. God immediately went into restoration mode immediately to bring us back. Now, uh, I'll just say, we, we haven't seen that in full, have we? We still believe that that is going to be done in full. And, man, I don't think any one of us know. And if you think you do, then we'll talk. But I, I'll question you. But um, if we really know how that's going to look and what is, what's going to happen, and we have so many things in Scripture that talks about what's, what things are going to look like, the new heavens and the new earth, and, and, and you, exactly how that's going to look and what, how that's going to happen, we don't really know. But we do know, and I think a lot of us in here have experienced parts of rest restoration that we can experience here now. I believe we can experience it here and now because of what he did. And I want to just say, uh, say this, uh, that basically the first step of restoration is something that is so opposite of what we'd often think. So opposite of what my human mind wants to grasp and think, but it's, it's called dying. It, it's called dying. We don't like that. That is not something that the human mind likes. That is something that we resist. And we, hey, you can take care of that ugly picture, Clark. <laughs> I mean, it's, I like it, but everybody else might say, what's that? <laughs> um, Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship. When sin entered the garden, not only was there destruction of the creation, not only was there things messed up that, that you know, we think and see, but, but what was really messed up? What was the deeper thing that really got messed up immediately? What happened when God walked and wanted to hang out with Adam and Eve like he always did? They kind of went to hide themselves. Something was messed up. Their relationship was messed up. 
It was marred. It was messed up. And God immediately set in place a way for us because what he wants is relationship. He wants to know us. He wants to walk with us by the river. He wants to take us into the the green pastures and he wants to talk with us and he wants to lift us up and he wants he wants that relationship. He doesn't need it. He wants it. He wants you. He wants to do work with you. He wants to build his kingdom with you. He wants that and the only way he can do it is with relationship. But it, he he's God's not a god of robots. He could have made us all robots so that we just worship him at a certain time and we couldn't help it. We'd just fall down and we'd worship him or we'd lift our hands and we'd worship him. But that's not what he wants. Have you ever done, have you ever tried to do relationship with somebody that was kind of like a robot? We can probably all say, yeah, we've probably experienced that. Maybe we've been that. I'm just saying. It's not real fun. It's really one-sided. If we just... It takes, for a relationship, it takes two people that are into the relationship. You can't, it, so God wanted somebody with, that he could do relationship with. He desired relationship, and it got messed up. And so he immediately went to plan it. And so for us, we have to give our bodies to God, a living sacrifice. That is the way that can be restored. Jesus also said when he walked on this earth, he's, um, that... Uh, Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it cannot bring fruit. And, and so a death is the first step of, of that relationship, restoring that relationship. So I just want to kind of look at, at two different perspectives here. I want, to, I want to kind of look at God's perspective. And, and, and I don't know if I'm going to do this right or not, but forgive me, but try to track with me. But I want to look at it from God's part one and, God, and our part with God two. Because without God doing his part, without us having any, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to mess this up. There's a part that only God can do. We cannot. We cannot. It is something that God can do and, and only God. Verse uh, 16 of John chapter 3, it says for this, and we all know this verse probably very well, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his, only, his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Another place it talks about the narrow way. Jesus talked about the narrow way, the narrow gate. And what does that mean? What did he mean by the narrow gate? What did he mean by the narrow way, the narrow gate, the, nar the narrow passage? I believe he was saying that the gate is so narrow that there is no other way to come to God, no other way for restoration except through him. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, dying on the cross, his blood was shed for our sins. And he also talked about the fact that there's others that are going to try to get into that fold other ways, and it's not going to work. There is only one way. That's how narrow the way is. That's how narrow the gate is. It's, it's the gate is Jesus Christ. And if we try any other thing, if we try our righteousness, if we try another God, um, the, it's useless. It, there is one way, and that's how narrow the gate is. And um, how often have we tried of ourselves? How often have we tried to lift ourselves up or to be righteous so that we can be on the right way? Um, in Isaiah 64, 6, uh, it says, Jesus, um, it said, we're all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they're nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like wind. This is what our righteousness looks like. This is what it looks like when we try to restore ourselves. So um, who can be restored? Well, who can be restored? We saw that the bus can be restored. It takes a creator. But who can be restored? I, I believe all of us. I, I, think, uh, I think people who really messed up their lives can be restored. People who made choices and decisions and ended up wherever can be, just, can be restored. I, I think that that's who can be restored. Think of the man on the other side of the lake. 
when the disciples got there with Jesus in the boat, and he was running around out of his mind and naked, and no chains were strong enough to keep him, and he was a menace to society over there. There was a real problem. He had living a, a real messed up di life. And the Bible tells us that after he met Jesus, after he had the experience of Jesus, he was sitting there, not naked anymore. He was clothed, and he was in his right mind. And that is a man that was restored. Think of Mary Magdalene, a woman who played a very important part in Jesus' walk on the earth that was with her, with him. And, and the Bible tells us that she had seven demons cast out of her. She was healed and delivered and, and, and restored by Jesus. So people who really messed up their lives, people who really mess up their lives can be restored. I praise God for that because I've messed up my life. We mess up our lives. We might mess up things tomorrow, but we have a, a father who loves us and who made a plan that we can, live, that we can be restored. Um, you know another, another group of us that need to be restored? The group of us who thinks we've got it figured out and we can, we've got it, Right? We need restoration, too. That's often us religious people, some of us people who maybe basically thought we were Christians since the day we were born. And uh, we need restoration. Think of Job. Think of Job. You know, we look at him as a man that was really amazing. But he needed God. He found out through all the things he walked through that he really is nothing without God. Think of King David. You know, we look at his life, and we're like, wow, he's, yeah, we know he messed up. He did. But he was a man whose heart was after God. But it wasn't like that on his own. He wasn't there because of his righteousness. It was because of God. He, he needed the king, the father's restoration. The apostle Paul, look at him. Here's a man that was going about. He thought he was doing God's work. He thought he was doing the right thing. He was hammered down, and he needed a Jesus experience. He needed restoration. And when he got it, it was amazing. Look at the picture of who Paul was, and after restoration, what happened? It, it was amazing. It's, I still love that picture. I love Paul's story. Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and perfect, good and pleasing and perfect. That's transformation. That's restoration. That's only what God can do. Um, only God can do that. So I want to look at our part in God's restoration plan. Now, don't get this confused. I mean, and I might share it in a confusing way. I hope not. God help me. But um, there's our part to do, isn't there? I mean, do, would we say not? Would, would we not say that, that, that Scripture shows us that, um, that there are things that we need to be a part of to be able to allow God to bring restoration and um, so I want, I want to read you a couple of verses. Um, there's, uh, I, th I thought of surrender. Uh, yesterday morning when I was studying here, I, the, the, the word surrender really just kind of came on me strongly. Um, and uh, I want to read to you about the church in Laodicea. Just, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but uh, in about... Verse uh, chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. Um, and Jesus is writing this letter. He says, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is a message from the one who is the, who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know all the things that you do. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you are lukewarm, like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich, I have everything I want, but I don't need anything. 
and I don't need anything. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that's been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so that you will not be ashamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and he will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will stand, sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. The, the church there, the Laodicea, he was addressing the church, but as you read that and you go back and you look at that, he was not just addressing the church together. He was, but he was also addressing them personally. He said it a couple of times, he, you. They needed to open the door. Jesus is a gentleman. God, our Father, Loves us and draws us, but he doesn't bust the door in like a SWAT team. He knocks on the door gently. He calls gently. His spirit calls us. And there was, there was a need for transformation. There was a need for restoration there. They had gotten to where they had. They were that one that had, they pretty much had it figured out. And, and I find myself there so many times. And then God gently knocks on the door, and, and we have to open it. That's, that's our part and part of that restoration. For us to, to turn that knob, to open the door, to allow him to come in, and he wants to restore that relationship. He wanted that relationship back that he had lost with the church at Laodicea. He wanted that back. He, he, he realized, even though they couldn't see it, how wretched, how miserable, how decayed they were. But all they needed to do was, through surrender, open that door. And I think um, there was, uh, in, when Jesus walked on the earth, I think either Matthew or Mark or maybe several of them recorded that, where he said that, that he stands at the door and he knocks. And it, or if, no, uh, I might be confused. I'm sorry. Just, just take that. So anyhow, um, uh, so we got to open the door. Another thing is in... Um, in First Peter, I'm going to read a few verses there about humbling. So, um, surrender, opening the door. Uh, the surrender kind of follows in. It's, it's just a full picture of surrender. But opening the door is something specific that I, that seems like is is just there. So, um, if we read in First Peter 5, chapter 6, to start reading there. So humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith, and remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Amen. That can only happen with humbling, with humility. We, the Bible says that uh, we must humble ourselves. I um, thought I had another verse here, but I might have not put that in here. Um, in, uh, there's, it's all throughout. This is only one verse where it talks about humbling. But I believe that, I'm not saying that God can't, do some things to help us to be humble. But I think he's asking us to humble ourselves. That is our part. That is the part that we can do is to become humble so that he can do the work that he wants to do in us. And for us proud Americans, it's really hard to do sometimes. It is hard to become humble. 
And that's why we need to ask God again to help us to become humble. And uh, so um, we could go with a lot of different things of of our part. In other words, um, God wants to do this with us. He wants us to do this with him. He is building his kingdom. So I had to think of Joshua and, and when they went to Jericho. Think about what happened. And, and I, I was recently reminded about that story of how that they went across the river. And they went over there, and then they went and walked around the city. And they did it very strategically. God asked them how to do, told them. He, sh- he showed them the plan of what to do. And, and let me ask you, I mean, could, uh, what took the walls down? Did they blow them down with cannons? No. I mean, God did it, right? Uh, I mean, there's... You come across some things, they say, well, they, they blew the trumpets and then they screamed at a certain pitch and you can put uh, size, I don't know, you can put you know, whatever shatters the chandelier sometimes. That's what took it down. Okay, whatever. Maybe, maybe not. It was God. It was God that did it. Okay? It was God that took the, because they were just following God's lead. They were obeying him Humbly walking. How stupid did that look? How stupid did that look? What? But yet they were willing to follow God's direction and walk around that city seven different days and then seven times another day. Did it make any sense? No, it didn't make any sense. Except that God asked us to do it. God asked them to do it. And so... God really, as much as he used Joshua and Jericho in that experience to restore the land of milk and honey, flowing with milk and honey, an amazing piece of land that was the Israelites to restore that back to them, they had to play a hand in it. He didn't just do it. They had to play a hand in it in in humbling themselves and walking around that city and all the other things. That's just one thing. Well, stepping their feet in the water, a swollen Jordan River that, like, you can't walk through that. Why am I ever going to stick my foot in the water? They had to do that. God wanted them to be a part of his plan. God wanted them to be an active part of his plan and do it when he asked them to, even if it looked silly or even if it maybe made them look stupid to their enemies, who they did not want to look silly to. Who wants to look silly in front of their enemies? No, we want to look strong and powerful and mighty, right? But the best place and the best way to look strong and powerful and mighty in front of our enemies is to say yes to God and humble ourselves and walk with him when he asks us to walk, when he asks us to open the door, when he wants us to open the door, when he wants us to follow his plan. And... uh, and so that's just one example. There's many. We can think of Gideon. We can think of David. We can think of all the different times when God did amazing, crazy stuff. And let's never mix it up with the fact that we need God's power. We have no power of ourselves to do it. It's only through God. And it's not us that did it. It's not our voices. of It, it is us walking as a, a living sacrifice every day, allowing God to use us and walk with him. That is when the enemy's going to say, whoa, what's, you know, and it's not us, it's God. We're lifting up Jesus. We're walking in his power, walking in his strength, walking in faith, even when it looks like the craziest thing to do when he's asking us to do it, that we do it. Our world needs that today. The world needs to see us. The people need to see us walking that way. They're looking for restoration. There's so much hurt. There's so much things going on in the world today. And us as God's people need to be walking this way and leading the way, just like the the priests and, and the Levites led the people into that. We are leaders today as high priests. It's a little different today. We don't have high priests. We don't look quite like that. 
Adam, Matt, you men here, we are the high priests of our households and the leaders of our community, and people are looking to us to, to lead them, and, 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 and they, they need us to say yes to God, and then they will say yes to God also. Um, in Joel, 20, in Joel 2, 25, 26, says, I will restore to you the years of, that the swarming locust has eaten, the, ho the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army, which I sent, up, sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dwelt, dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Acts 3, 19 through 21, repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that the time at that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed to you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So as we humble ourselves before God, as we surrender ourselves to him, as we open the door he is the God of turning greed to contentment. He is the God of turning shame into a double portion. He is the God of bitterness, turning bitterness into sweetness. He's the God of turning lust into love. And he is the God of turning envy into generosity and fear into peace and hate into love. And don't we see that today? Don't we want to be a part? I think we need to strive to be a part of God's part in doing that because he could just say and it would be done but he doesn't work with robots he works with humans that say yes to him that are surrendered to him and who want to and desires to work with them as he builds his kingdom right here right now today for such a time as this in isaiah 61 7 it says instead of your shame there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. The other day, while I was working in the egg room collecting eggs, I thought of shame. And I was like, well, what's the opposite of shame? What's, what's the good side of... Well, and I couldn't, I couldn't come over there. I was like, well, what, my mind's not working. But shame, who, who has experienced shame? Okay, the rest of you are lying. So um, shame is a part of what we experience in the fallen world since the fall in the garden, right? And it's horrible. It is like the worst thing. It makes us, it makes us not be able to be about the work of the kingdom that God wants us to be. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't even know if I prayed and asked God. I probably, maybe I did. But I couldn't come up with a, what what the what do you call it the anti anti I'm not teaching one the opposite of shame so and and this morning uh, maybe it was yesterday I'm not sure I was reading and I got to Isaiah sixty one seven and it said instead of your shame there shall be a double portion I was like Whew, wow that's amazing I'm not sure what that means except because I was like something just I was just like, that's amazing. But I still couldn't really wrap my mind about what he was really saying there. What's he saying? How, how can that? doesn't make sense. But you know what I thought of? So uh, who gets a check every now and then? Like maybe from work. Okay. So maybe it's $500. Wouldn't you be excited if it would be $1,000? And you weren't expecting it? Wouldn't you get excited about that? Or what if uh, you... I don't know, we're expecting a $100,000 check for something, right? And you'd get it and you look at it and it's 200000 Or how about 500000 and you'd get it? I'm talking language that we all work, right? I mean, is that connecting? <laughs> so if it would be a $500,000 check that you're expecting, and you'd open the envelope and you look and it'd be a million, you'd be like, oh my word. Wow, what I can do. I don't know. It, <laughs> I mean, think of how powerful that would make you feel. I, I'm not, this is getting a little carnal, okay. But just think of that. That's what he said. A double portion instead of dishonor. Instead of shame, there should be a double portion. I don't know. I still don't really get it. That's just where my mind went because that's where I go. But that's our God. He wants to turn our shame 
into a double portion. Dear Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you that you're a God of restoring. I thank you that you love us so much that you allowed your son to be crucified and you, you die and die on the cross and experience death for us to take our place so that we can be restored to you. And God, I don't know where everybody is here this morning. And maybe there's some that uh, haven't even ever opened the door the first time to you. And although we know that uh, in, Rome, in, in uh, Revelations that's uh, kind of given the idea that the church that knew you had kind of cooled off and walked away and you were asking them to come back to you, but uh, you draw all. doesn't matter who it is. doesn't matter what the situation. doesn't matter how bad the sin. doesn't matter... It doesn't matter. You you care about us, and I thank you for that, Lord. And I just want to lift up your name, and I ask that that our lives, um, that we would say yes to you, that we'd open that door, and that for a time like this where we're at today, right here today, tomorrow, the next day, that we would be kingdom builders with you because we've said yes and because we've given you the opportunity and we've been humble and surrendered to you so that you could do the work that you want to do in our lives and that you want to restore us and that you want us to be a part of restoring other people's lives because that's how you do things. Lord, and I thank you for that. I bless your name and praise you and just go with us in Jesus' name. Amen.